All right. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all for allowing us to present this important information this morning. Uh, this is the largest group of people that I think we have had since I have been at the department. So that just is a testament to the importance of the information that we'll be sharing today. We've been hearing loud and clear from important stakeholders, such as yourselves and others out in the field, of the unintentional negative impact of incredibly positive move to universal free lunch for all students that we did, this much needed move had the consequence, as you know, of the reduction in families turning in those free and reduced lunch forms, which is what Title I has used for alternative data for small districts, any uh, districts under 20,000 in reallocating tiding, Title I funding more accurately for our state. So we've been engaging in some cross uh, collaborations to address this. We have been engaging in research and running data sets to make more informed decisions based on what will do the least harm to our districts so that we can best utilize the flexibilities in what Maine has been given permission by the USDOE to use for a primary poverty measure for our districts that have been deemed small since 2002. So we know that this comes right at the midst of budget season and this information is crucial to all of your budgets. So we have a lot of information to share today and we want to be able to share it all with you. We also want an opportunity to hear what questions you have that still exist, which will allow us to continue to shape out uh, the move forward with this decision. And we also wanna let you know that we will be sharing this slideshow as Rita said, we are recording it. We're gonna have uh, ongoing notifications. We're gonna share any links and resources with you so you don't have to feel like you need to capture every possible word to, in today's presentation. This is gonna give you a sense of the direction that we're going in. So during this presentation, as Rita has said, as you've come into the meeting, please keep yourself on mute so that we can share all of the information. I will monitor the chat for questions if you wanna go ahead and pop them in the chat as they're at the top of your thinking. But at the end of the presentation, we'll also allow people to unmute themselves and ask any questions that you might have or further clarifications that are, that are needed. Um, and we also want to let you know that our current plan is to release the preliminary allocations, not only for Title I, but for all the titles that we have in our department, one, two, three, four, and five, on April 13th. That's our current plan right now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce two people who have been instrumental in leading this charge, Rita Pello and Jessica Karen, who are both our Title I specialists here at the Maine Department of Education, and they will walk you through the work that has gone into the decision-making around this issue. And at this point, I'll turn the microphone over to Rita. Thank you, Cheryl, and thanks everyone for being here. I know it's a, um, a big day, a big update, so I would love to run through the agenda really briefly. We have and are going to take the opportunity to kind of demystify the Title I allocation process overall very briefly this morning. Um, I think it's a helpful reset. There are folks on this call who may be very aware of how Title I funds are distributed to LEAs and then schools and others who may be new and want a refresher. So we're going to be happy to provide an overview of, of just what is and how is Title I allocation and how they're formed and distributed. Um, we will talk about the allowable data sets that we were able to test out uh, for this FY24 year. Um, we will talk about the decision-making process and provide an update on what decision has been made and then the important implications for folks on this call today to consider. Now, this, of course, is a conversation that will continue um, and we will be happy to provide support um, but hopefully this will be a great foundation for how we are moving forward as a state to provide for our, um, our students who need it most. So I'm going to get us started here. Um, questions at the end, like Cheryl said, but please feel free to chat uh, them as they, as they come into your mind. We may answer them uh, as we go. So I did want to provide um, 
an overview of overall <laughs> where this money comes from. Um, we are talking about appropriations of funding every year that Congress must approve. Um, obviously, language changes and other sort of new information is not added every year, only when there's a real reauthorization like there was with ESSA back in 2015, 2016. Um, so what they do every year, though, is they do pass the amount of funds that they will appropriate for the Elementary Secondary Education Act, amongst others. Um, and then, of course, that goes to the U.S. Department of Education, where once the once Congress has approved the funds for the titles um, in Title I specifically, they then allocate to the states based on a formula. Um, and then we as a state get a lump sum. Um, we are we get uh, I shouldn't even say that because we'll talk about where they come from, but we do get an amount as a state of Maine and based on the guidelines and statute. Uh, we reserve up to the 7% of funds for tier three for school improvement, um, and the rest goes directly to the LEAs, the folks here on the call today, um, where there is, uh, with statutory, uh, of course, limitations, there is autonomy for districts to allocate the funds based on highest needs. And for folks here with Title I programs, we know that there are two types. So you're running targeted programs or school-wide programs at the school level. So that's how it goes from Congress appropriating funds to uh, the US DOE, to the state, to the districts, and then to the students in the, the doors of the schools. Um, one really important, uh, I think, caveat to the lump sum that I just said is that actually it comes in four distinct funding streams. And why that's important for LEAs to understand is because um, they're actually different criteria, minimally different, but different criteria for actually being eligible for those funding streams. So if you're doing quick math this morning, you will see that we were allocated just about $62 million this year, um, divided by those four funding streams you see there. The basic grant, the concentration grant, targeted, and what we lovingly call EFIG, or the Education Finance Incentive Grant. Um, and what you'll see on the right of the table is that they have different eligibility criteria. Um, they, uh, for every single one, you need at least 10 children in the school, or LEA, that have uh, low income status. Um, and then the percentages of that changes. So for basic, it's a 2% poverty rate at the base level. You'll see with concentration, it's 15%. So what this formula is doing and what the four grants are doing are sort of weighting, they're weighting different poverty percentage and rates in order to, to determine what an LEA is eligible for and then what part of funding that LEA receives. Um, this year, we noticed when Jess and I were um, analyzing the difference from last year, the USDOE, whether it was USDOE or Congress, appropriated more funds in the targeted and EFIG so that 5% threshold than they did for basic. I actually think we may have received less in the basic grant this year. So it is, um, it is slightly different and fluctuates for those reasons. Now, one really important thing that happens when we do receive those four funding streams is they all have what's called a hold harmless provision. Um, and what that basically means is that for SAUs with those certain poverty levels, so you see that if you're an SAU or LEA with 30% uh, or higher poverty or 15 to 30, you actually cannot receive less than 95% or less than 90% of what you've received in the past year. Um, and this is essentially to do exactly what you think it, it's trying to do, which is to minimize the level of uh, sort of disparate and fluctuating figures in order for long-term planning and trends to be actually something a school and LEA can settle on, right? Your supplemental funding, how you're using it, if it's for people in your building. It's essentially to make sure year to year that you're not having to make crazy decisions around the fact that your funding is fluctuating an immense amount. And so I will say, and I think this is the largest caveat to me when I started this job and what I understand about allocations that I really wanna to explain to everyone today is that you're actually helping other districts. So if a district is losing slight poverty percentages, they are being bolstered by other districts. And so it is a communal pot of money 
that is um, that basically LEAs who may have lost poverty percentages can't lose a certain amount, and that money is distributed amongst all LEAs. So there is like um, a communal sharing happening amongst the entire state of Maine and all LEAs to ensure that districts are not losing or fluctuating from year to year. So I think that's just a very important um, statutory provision and formula that we adhere to um, that does sort of um, is shared amongst all of us on the call today. And then the last thing that I want to just talk about quickly, uh, Cheryl alluded this to this right in the beginning of the presentation. And essentially the real onus that we have is actually only for LEAs or SAUs with less than 20,000 people in the residency. So the Bangors and the Lewistons and the Portlands of Maine um, are actually, we are not choosing a poverty data set for those uh, SAUs. They are in fact locked into the census formula that the US government uses. Today, what we are talking about is the fact that we have options to use alternate poverty data sets for small SAUs. For SAUs basically are categorized as, uh, small SAUs are categorized as a town with less than 20,000 residents as measured. And so when towns fluctuate from 19,000 people to 20,000, we no longer choose the data set for that particular uh, district. That district is now locked in to the census data and the formulas that the U.S. government uses from SAPI, which is small area income and poverty estimates. So I just think that's another really key thing. And for statutory or law folks here, nerds like me, um, it's, uh, it's right here written in statute. So for small local educational agencies, we can distribute um, grants using an alternative method approved. And so <laughs> with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Jess, who's going to talk about a little bit more of the context in Maine specifically um, and how this has played out in the last 20 years for us here and in the last five and how we're going to move forward. So I'll, I'll let Jess take it away. Great, thank you, Rita. So for you, those of you who have been in the Title I world for a long time, you may remember in 2002, Maine was approved for an alternate method to use free meal student counts in the Title I allocation formula for those small SAUs that Rita identified in the former slides. At this time, we determined as a state that free meal student counts were the best measurement of student level poverty that, that we had. And again, just the caveat, this only applies to small SAUs. So now we are in a new context. In March, 2020, the COVID pandemic began. In school year 2022-2023, Maine's Meals at No Cost was passed, LD1679. And because students are eating for free, which we support completely, the truth of the matter is that there's not as much incentive to fill out those forms. This is happening in Maine, and it is also happening across the country. So the last three years for Title I allocations, we use pre-pandemic data from October 2019. Each year, we tested out those 2019 numbers compared to the new data set that was collected with free meal counts and realized the least amount of harm, the least percentage of harm to districts was using the older data set. For this coming school year, we will not be able to use older data sets. Why is that? The National School Lunch Program Sorry, going back to my notes here. Um, so for the National School Lunch Program, the last two years, this data was not required to be collected at the federal level level, hence the exception to use the old data. We triple checked this with the feds, 
with the U.S. Department of Education, and we will no longer have the flexibility to utilize old data for Title I allocations or for the rank and distribution table. We've highlighted this in red here as well on the rank and distribution table. You will be required to use the most recent poverty data. So at this point, we began to research other potential options for measuring student level poverty for small SAUs. And this is where it gets exciting, talking about the options. What options do we have as a state? So we're gonna go into more depth with each of these options. The, the first three options that we have listed here, the free meal student counts, direct certification student counts, and direct certification student counts with the 1.6 multiplier. The census data is something that the Maine Department of Ed and U.S. Department of Education are working on a collab. Uh, they're looking into as a solution. It's very complex. It'll take time to develop as a potential solution. There's challenges in particular with rural versus urban estimation processes, and that's going to require more time to examine its effectiveness as a model for Maine. Other states do this, but we do not because we did not find it was a reliable reliable indicator for rural towns and not an accurate representation of the poverty in schools. Okay, so for the free lunch application. So this was what we've been using from 2002 to 2023. So this was based on the completion and submission of free and reduced lunch meal applications completed by families and submitted to the SAU. So using those free meal student counts and enrollment figures, that's how we determine the poverty percentage for Title I allocations distributed to small SAUs. direct certification. So what is direct certification? Direct certification is a federally mandated process. It's the process of certifying eligible children for meals without the need for household applications. DHHS provides us students who qualify for SNAP, TANF, or a combination, as well as students who are in foster care. Then the Maine Department of Education incorporates homeless and migrant students to ensure that the districts have not already, the students that districts have already identified are not missed. This list is visible on the direct certification list that is provided in NEO and for use by the superintendents and food service staff. What is direct certification with a 1.6 multiplier? It is exactly what it says. It is those counts with multiplier. So what? So I've just provided an example here of what that looks like. Um, so you can see the 1.6 multiplier is bolstering the poverty percentage by increasing that poverty percentage. So in column A, we have the direct certification student count, 36. Multiply it by 1.6, you have 57.6. The enrollment count is 243. We divide that 57.6 divided by 243, and we have 23.7% for poverty. Without that 1.6 multiplier, the poverty percentage would be 14.8. So what's some of this research that we did? So um, we looked at all those options. We started meeting as an internal group across the department with a diverse section of teams. And we partnered with MEPRI, um, to, which is, a, was, is Maine's Maine Education Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan research institute funded by the Maine State Legislature and UMaine system to do research. We began attending national working group sessions on other alternate measures and what other states are looking into with AASA, the American Association of School Administrators, and the CCSSO, Council of Chief State School Officers. We also began to run comparative data studies for FY24 Title I allocations in particular. 
And so like any sort of research process, we did have guiding questions that I think most folks on this call will understand, right? We were looking for the poverty data set that had the least percentage decreases across all SAUs. So we were looking for the least amount of districts affected negatively with the data set. We also do and believe that it's important for us to have a data set that is consistent from year to year and maybe most consistent from prior years. So which data set, if we are not going with three and reduced, would be at least similar to what districts are expecting or have had, even with the old data set that we had been using from 2019. And then of course, too, which poverty data set will be the most accurate methodology in the long run. So long-term questions, as well as just in the short term, what can LEAs rely on? Which data set and poverty and allocation can they most rely on from year to year? So with that being said, I'm going to uh, give the next slide, which will be um, our decision. So our decision for FY24 allocations is to go with the direct certification with a 1.6 multiplier. And again, why, right? And to answer the above questions, essentially this data set moves us to a more long-term verifiable data point to accurately capture student level data. It also, most importantly for folks on this call, had the smallest number of high percentage Title I funding decreases. So that's those five, 10, and 15% from Hold Harmless, looking for the least amount of districts who are losing those funds. It also bolsters the poverty count. So you can expect that poverty counts with the direct cert are lower. And the reason why this was important to us is because we've heard from our relationships with ESEA coordinators and business managers um, and folks in, on the, you know, in schools that the poverty count itself may not really represent the needs of the students in the schools. Um, and so it was important for us to um, ensure that, again, we wouldn't have so many districts losing an intense amount with direct cert and they would all be bolstered. And this is also true, if you remember the second slide about the eligibility for funding streams, we have quite a few small SAUs in the state of Maine that have maybe only 50 students. And if they only captured seven or eight in direct certification, they actually would lose eligibility and would receive zero dollars. The hold harmless provision is no longer there if they lose complete eligibility. And so for some of our small SAUs, it's really important that we bolstered that number so that they would at least receive, and they usually it's small amounts, but that they would continue to receive the money that they have um, relied on in the past. And that was very important for us. We recognize now that some pieces of this collected student enrollment data, in particular, the free and reduced meal applications are no longer used in the Title I allocation process. However, we want to make it crystal clear that these free and reduced meal applications will still be required for child nutrition data collection and the EPS formula. We also want to note that SAU collected data includes the homeless and migrant student counts, which are verified by the superintendent by October 30th. So those counts will be included. So be sure to be triple checking those figures. In the direct certification process, SNAP and TANF student counts are received from DHHS, and then local processes take place at the SAU level to verify that direct certification student list. The federal requirement is to minimally update this direct certification list three times a year. There should also be local processes in place to help families verify SNAP and TANF if they are not on the list and should be. We created this chart just to showcase the difference of the student enrollment data collection. So as I just noted in the previous slide, the TANF SNAP foster care students, that source of data is directly from DHHS. And the source of data for the migrant student enrollment and homeless student enrollment is from the 
information that you locally submit into NEO. Um, so that student enrollment data collection process opens October 1st and closes October 30th.